my wife is not here. <laughs> so we're going to preach about ladies. <laughs> Amen. I can't get in trouble if she's not here. <laughs> Amen. Let's take our Bibles to go to Genesis chapter number one. Genesis chapter number one. I, uh, I, I think it's important this morning that we're going to, we're talking about the church. We, that's where we've been at recently about the importance of, uh, of, of understanding our doctrine. And we've come all the way from the existence of God all the way through our man and man's need of a savior, and that's who Jesus is, and the fact that he's now established a body that, that he uses to do his will, and that body is the church. And so here we are right now. We're in uh, Genesis chapter number one. Go there with me this morning, and we're going to start in verse number 27. And uh, if, you're, if you're here this morning, you're here for what I would consider to be a foundational message, foundational in the sense of uh, to understand uh, what our church is about. Now, I'm going to start by saying this. Women in our society have been demoted. Now, you would say, oh, no, no, pastor. We lived, we lived in an enlightened era. Before, I'm, everybody tells me before, it was awful to be a woman. And now it's great. And we have everything good now. And because people have come in and, and they've gotten rid of the old ideas about men and women. And they, they've gotten new stuff and it's better. But let me, just, let me just tell you the truth. The truth is that when you leave the principles of the word of God, you begin to reality. And this morning, I want to bring us back to reality. If we pretend that we can undo the things that are true and reinvent them in a new light as new truth, we have not done ourselves a favor. We've just warped the truth into falsity. And that's exactly what's happened in every area of our thinking where we've departed from the teachings of the word of God. We've messed it up. This definitely includes the role of women. Women have been demoted in our society. What I mean by that is pretty simple. What God established when he first made man and woman has now been eradicated by causing our young people to grow up in a, in a, uh, a society where we have totally forgotten that God created the whole world, that he established the whole system and that to work a certain way. And the same way that each part of nature has its place and has its role and it does its thing. If we then attempt to take one part of, of, of nature and warp it into something else, we will not have helped nature, we will have hurt it. And in the end, we will be causing catastrophes down the line that we'll be in, in turn trying to fix. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Here's the Bible says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. This idea of a man and woman, the distinction between two genders was not created as a social construct by Western philosophers a couple thousand years ago. No, no. That was created not by just a, a, a happenstance of evolution and it, and, it, and it worked for our particular species and some other species and other species don't need it. And, and for us, it's a give and take. No, no. This idea of subjectivity, that it can be whatever you want it to be. And if anybody tells you it's a certain way, it's just simply how that person perceives it. And really, we don't have to take that as, as, as fact. That is not for a moment reality. Now, here's reality. Reality is that when God established the world, when he made the rivers and the mountains and the clouds, when he established a cycle for water that would be con uh, condensation, would cause it to form clouds, and then we would have eventually them come perspiration, and you would have it uh, uh, rain upon the earth, and it would flow down the rivers and go back in the ocean and in the clouds, and, and we have this beautiful cycle of water. This was made by God, by God and God alone. Now, here's, here's what we've done. We have pretended that everything happened by accident. We are telling our children that the way they got here 
was just weird flukes, just absolute crazy, just all of a sudden non-living matter became living, and then very simplistic forms became very, 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 very complex forms. Just happened that way. And the fact that you have a mommy and a daddy and you need to have a man and a woman and a male and a female to be able to have new life, that just happened by, by accident. It's not necessary. It's not a law. It just happened that way in this time. And the idea that a man and a woman become one flesh is simply an accident. The Bible would say that's not true. Turn to chapter number 2 of Genesis chapter 18. In the beginning of chapter 2, God created woman. Here's what happens here. It says in verse number 21, Genesis chapter, I'm sorry, verse number 18. Uh, ver, I'm sorry, excuse me. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good for, that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Brother Victor, I'm going to turn this, this monitor off for a moment. Okay, brother, it's going to, it's just, the folks just give us patience as we make this better, but it's distracting me. There we go. Okay. Now, we're still, I know if it sounds odd to you, we're still working on it. We're going to get the kinks out of it slowly but surely. We are all, the, the, the team who are working on this, we're all kind of learning. But uh, we're trying to, I'm trying to get the feedback out of it. It's coming back right now to my own ears. Okay, we're in Genesis chapter number 2, verse 18. It just said this, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. The word meet means appropriate or perfect or right exactly meeting the level that he needs. So whatever this help is going to be, it's exactly what this man, Adam, needs. So then God, in verse number 21, God caused a, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he, God, took one of his, Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked. The man and his wife, and were not ashamed. There was perfect exposure right there where he could be exactly who he was in front of her, and she could reveal her whole self, her whole heart, everything to him, and they became one. This is how whole history started. This is not just the Christian view. This is reality. If you reject it, you rejected the truth. You rejected history. Every single person on this globe is the offspring of these two human beings. And the way that these human beings came about was God created Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The reason that we have his wife Eve is because God then took his rib and formed Eve out of Adam. This is how it is supposed to be. Now, unfortunately, Adam and Eve sinned. And there's consequences for that sin. Turn to chapter number 3, verse 16. Chapter number 3, just one page over, verse 16. Now, if you say, Pastor, I don't like this. Well, you cannot like it, but it won't change reality. You can try to force everyone else to change their ideas and not believe it, but it doesn't matter. It's still true whether every other person says it's not true or not. This is reality. Verse number 3, 16, it says, Unto the woman, this is God, after they had sinned, God says unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, that doesn't mean that men got away scot-free by no means. If you look at the next few verses, you will discover what we in our society are trying to flip on his head. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, 
for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and into dust shalt thou return. So we see here that when God saw man's sin, he came down and he judged man for it. And here was the consequence of it. He tells the woman, you are now going to have a very difficult time bearing children. And it says, unto your, your husband shall your desire be, and he shall rule over thee. Now, it doesn't matter if you attempt to create a society where that's not the case. It will always be the case that men rule over women, the male over the female. You say, I don't like that. I, I, I'm sorry. I just, just this how, that's, how, that's how it's going to be. I, could, I won't do it at this moment, maybe later on in this sermon if you have enough time. But if you take your, your, your Bible to the New Testament and look up these words, own husbands, you will discover that the Bible is adamant that a woman is not subject to me, except one, and that is my wife. That's it. That every other woman in this room right now, uh, if you're not my daughter and unmarried, you are subject not to me, as, as far as man goes. It's not that all men rule over, over all women. That's not what the Bible says. But you I say, when you attempt to undo God's plan, that is what does happen. Eventually, you will have it where women will be demoted. And that's what's happening right now. Women are being put in positions in which men always excel them. It has been said to our women that if you really are free, then you must be forced to take upon you every role of a man. And then in every relationship, there has to be a 50-50 cut. Well, the result is what? The result is that eventually women are put into positions that if you put them against a man, the men, on average, always excel them. That has not been a blessing to women. In recent weeks, we've seen a politician shot in the ear. Somebody tried to blow his head off. And if you've seen any of the footage, there was an outcry. Because the president's entourage, his bodyguard, is made up of all of tall, strong men who could cover him. But in this situation, there were a few ladies. Now, ladies, let me, let me, let me just, just tell you what you'll see if you go online. People made fun of the fact that you have this little lady doing that. And sure enough, a few days later, the next time there was a big event, it was all men. Now, we can make fun of that. Let me just say, it's how it's going to be. Let me, let me tell you, a few years ago, I, this is the first time I understood this. I did not know this before. I was in college in China with an American young man who, was, um, who had gone to a university on a tennis scholarship. And so <clears throat> after he finished, he came to China to study Chinese, uh, ended up marrying a Chinese girl, and they're still married and lives in Texas now. Um, he, he got to go to, uh, to, to, to school on a tennis scholarship because he was really good at tennis. I mean, he was really good at tennis. But he was not ranked in the top 100 of the world, as far as men goes. He was actually ranked, the camera was, was somewhere you know, below in the 100 somewhere, but he was actually somewhere in the worldwide rankings. <laughs> but uh, he, he actually was in our school. And so here's a man who was not good enough to make a single dollar playing tennis, but he was so good that, uh, that, that he would be, he was being asked by other people around the area to play tennis with them, and he always beat them. And he got to play, come to find out, the president of this very large university, tens of thousands of students, he was this older a Chinese gentleman was actually enjoyed tennis. And so, so they got, he got to play tennis with the president. And eventually he got to play in the, in the Chinese uh, Open. Uh, and it went that, that high, you know, it was neat. But I remember talking to him. And he, he, we were talking about this subject about, wow, back then the Williams sisters were like at the peak of their, uh, of their fame and their, their success. And I remember when uh, talking about them, I said, wow. Um, and we were, we were discussing it. And he made this claim to me. He said that any man who's in the top couple hundred positions in the world could beat the world's number one woman in tennis any time. He said that. There's a good chance that I could, I could beat either one of the three sisters. Now, he could not make a dollar at it. Now, later on, Serena Williams made the exact same claim. She admitted it. If you understand golf, you'll understand that any time a woman has tried to get into men's golf, it hasn't gone very, very well. There's a reason why the NFL has not really had a trove of 
women as, as line women. Right now, we've got one basketball player who still does not, woman basketball player who still does not look like an NBA caliber player, but she, just because she's, it's just, it's just no comparison. Let me, let me just quickly say, that's okay. You see, I did not marry my wife because she could beat me up. My wife has a black belt in Taekwondo. I've had exactly zero Taekwondo lessons in my life. Now, I have imagined myself as a Taekwondo expert many times. I've had many battles in my bedroom against... I, I'm going to show you my form, but it's pretty good. I married this girl. Now, when I first heard about my wife, this is my first time hearing about her. I was in a, a, the, the, a pastor's office, the president of my Bible college. He was telling me about this church, good church, good pastor. And he said, and there is a young lady there. Her mom's Korean. She's going to study medicine. She's, she's got a pilot's license. I'm like, what? She has a black belt. I'm thinking, I'm, you could not imagine the image I got of this, this person. And I was like, oh. <laughs> wow. Now, let me say, my wife is amazingly fast. You try to, you know, tickle, flirt. Wham! It's just so fast. It's really fast. You know what we quickly found out in our relationship? She has no chance. Honestly, I'm just too big. I have no skills. She has all of them. I am a man. She's a woman. Now, fortunately, we were already married when I found that out. I'm like, what? I thought you could protect me. <laughs> and I was going to go to China. You, I, are you serious? No, I'm just kidding. You know, I did not, I, I, I got to decide who I was going to live my life with. I could choose anybody. Adam Aram Judson, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Hudson Taylor, a great missionary to China, he went to China with a friend. They were partners. He had another he had other men he would go out and, and preach the gospel with. And, Paul had, had Barnabas and later on had Silas, and you have great partners, amen? So I get to choose who I'm going to live my life with. You know what I chose? A woman. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't even close. But I did not choose her because she's better at anything than me. I chose her because. I wanted, I would do anything to spend my life with her. Now, the fact that she is better than me at so many different things, as many of anybody who knows her and me knows, does not change the fact that I didn't marry her because she was better than me. I married her because I wanted desperately to live my life with her. That's what I wanted. And I have left my father and my mother, and I cleave unto my wife not because she is my equal, but because I love her. And what we have decided is to demote women by forcing them to be in roles they shouldn't be in. Right now in Ukraine, they've run out of men, so they're trying to, they've been using now for, for over a year a lot more women. And so there's now a lot of footage of, of, these, of these women, you know, of, of just how they're, they're taking it. And let me just say, that, uh, that you have some pretty tough ladies that, that, are, that are doing an amazing job, but it's still not up to the level of men. And you know what? I'm glad about that. I don't want to have a tough woman who can't wait to get back into the trenches. I want a woman who is a woman. That's what I want. But we've done that. So let me just say this morning, number one, Women are not men. They are different. They have different roles. Women, on average, are physically weaker than men. That's just how it is. That in any sport you look at, if you, if you have a man who says he's a woman and enters that sport, he has a distinct advantage because he's a man. And if we continue with the trend, we're, the trend we're going on, you will soon have every single woman's record being held by a man. Well, except gymnastics, imagine. Um, so we have these, this reality that, hey, this is just, we are not all the same. That for every man is music 
our ears because we don't want to spend our life around some other tough, bearded, uh, hunk of flesh there with all these muscles. Ah, no way. I want a woman. Amen. That's natural. That's the way God made it. Amen. Now, let me say right now, women in our eyes, ladies, women are crystal to be put on a shelf, to be admired, to be taken down, to be used in very protected in moments. This is men are plastic. We are supposed to bounce and we're supposed to be used for the dirty jobs. And that's where are we excel. And let me say, I don't know why it is, but something in us likes to know that we are really tough, rubber made plastic. And we want to show every other piece of crystal out there. I'll show every piece of rubber. I am more rubbery than you and I can handle bigger, dirtier jobs than you so that I can earn a prettier piece and bigger, more cr of crystal. And I do not for a second want my crystal vase being used to empty out the flooded basement of sewage just to prove that we are in some sense equal. That is very offensive. I am married to a masterpiece of femininity, beauty, grace. I my wife employed to change it. You there, brother? I do not want my wife employed in those tasks. Now, if there had be a time when she had to, she would do it. And the whole time we are we are lifting wood together and chopping it and trying to get through some mud pit. She would do it. She would do it very well, and I would feel terrible because that's not what I want for my wife. Next. Nobody has ever heard of a trophy husband. Amen. You know what all those guys got? I mean, you know what I got? I got a trophy wife. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Now, you, you know, this is this is there's you know the man who just has a wife just to be see, look what I've got. You know, I've got that plus she can do everything. I'm a lucky guy. But let me just go on and say this then. God, if you go through your Bible, God never made women to become major leaders in any organization. Go through, go through your Bible. You say, well, we're in 2024. It's different now. Then we're wrong. You go from the beginning of history, God has always chosen men. Men to lead his people, Israel. Men to be the kings. Men to be the disciples. Men to lead the churches. That's what he established as the way it should go. And in every home, he established the ideal to be that men lead. That's what he wants it to be. Except once in the Bible. Turn to, be, to Judges chapter number 4. Judges chapter number 4. Now, the book of Judges is an interesting time in Israel's history. And in Judges chapter number 4, you will see the one instance in the Bible where a woman is called by God to become the national leader of Israel. And I want you to see the situation here. When this woman, now, I love the book of Judges because you see all these tough guys. I mean, these gruddy guys, these guys who do great things. This is the story of Samson. This is the story of Jephthah. This is where you find Gideon. But there's this one era of time in Genesis chapter 4, I'm mean, sorry, Judges chapter 4, verse number 1. It says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, when Ehud, another tough guy, was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, and, uh, who, that reigned in Hazor, the captain uh, of whose host was Sisera, who dwelt in Horesheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under a palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Folks, you say, Pastor, I thought you said this, this doesn't happen. Well, I guess it does. Every bit from, the, you, you look at how God called a man all the way through the book of Genesis, 
all the way through Moses, all the way through Joshua, and now we've come all the way up from Phineas, all the way up to Ehud. We have a woman that is now in charge. A woman is the one people are going to, men and women, when they need to have help making a judgment call. Now, after her, you will not see another woman again. The entire Bible that will be called of God to lead nationally. You'll see great leaders in women. You will see uh, people, who, women who did great things for God, but you'll never see the leader being called of God saying, I want this lady to do it, except Deborah. I want you to see then what happens here. Verse number six. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take the uh, 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee, unto the river of Kishon, Sisra, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver them into thine hand. So I want you to notice what just happened here. Barak is a man. He's not a woman. It's a man. And she calls Barak. Deborah says, Barak, God, didn't he call you to do this? Didn't you go? Now, she asks him a rhetorical question. Didn't he tell you? Didn't, isn't this what God said? Has not God done this? And the answer was yes. But Barak has yet to do it. So she finally calls him and says, hey, God told you, didn't he tell you, to go over there from the tribes of, of Naphtali and Zebulun, find 10,000 guys, and go over there, and he's going to deliver sister into your hand. Did he tell you that? Did he say that to you? No. She does not stand up and do it. She calls a man that God wants to do it and says, I want that man to go and fight this, not the woman. I want the man. What do you say? God wanted Barak, and Barak has been at home pretending he did not hear God's command. Then he got summoned by Deborah. Yes, ma'am. Didn't God command thee to do this? Look what Barak says. Verse 8, And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I'll go. But if thou wilt not go with me, I will, I will, I will not go. <laughs> Folks, this is their best man. This is their mightiest guy. Danny, isn't that awesome? The entire country. Like, oh, you know what? Barak, you can do this. Yeah. He acts like, I didn't hear anything. Finally, like, Barak says, get over here. Didn't God say that? Well, if you go, I'll go. If you don't go, I'm not going to go. I think we're getting a picture of why God had to call a woman to be the leader. But I want you to see how a true, godly woman thinks. Verse number nine. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. She's, she's disgusted. And she says, okay, I'll go. But fine. You know what God's going to do? God's going to make sure that a woman gets the credit. Yeah, I'll go with you. She did not want to be in the front. You know why she was in the lead? Because no man stood up and took the lead. But a godly woman, as soon as a man comes on the scene, says, take the lead, please. Go ahead. Take the lead. I'm willing to follow. Take the lead. I'm strong. I'm stronger than you, but I will get behind you and let you lead me. And when he says, no, please, if you, only if you go. If you don't go with me, I'm not going to go. She says, okay, I'll do it. I will be next with you. I will be there to prop you up. But let me tell you, because of it, you know who's going to get the, the glory for this? A woman. Let me tell you how it happens. This is a great story. Sure enough, they win the battle. And the Bible says in verse number 15, And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled on uh, his feet. And Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host. 
Now look down in verse number 17. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jaber the king of Hazor and of the house of Heber the Kenite. Jael, this is his wife, went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her, into the tent, he cover, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink. I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent. It shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there a man here? Thou shalt say, No. Then Jael, Haber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand. And very delicate, you see how femininity, look at this, and went softly unto him. And wham, smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground. For he was fast asleep and wearied. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show you the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. <laughs> wow! So if you look what happens in verse in chapter 5, there is a song that is sung by Barak and Deborah. And in this, you know who figures mightily in there? Jael does. And she had this man who had, who had tormented her people for 20 years. And now he comes in in his moment of weakness and she says, here, lay down. You're good. You're good. You're good. All right. Have a good little sleep. <laughs> and uh, then wham, the nail goes in there. A woman gets the credit. Barak does all the work of fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. But you know who gets all the glory? Jael does. Jael does. And so uh, tonight when Brother Roth is here, he can tell you there's a friend of ours whose name is Jael because of that Jael in the Bible. And so guess what? She's still getting the glory to this very day for what she did. But I want you to see this. I want you to see that in the Bible there is an example of a woman being a leader. You know when that example was? When no man was willing to lead I could give you a scenario where I believe it'd be biblical for a woman to become the leader of a church. I could give you that example. But it would be to the dishonor of every man in that church. There should be a man who's willing to stand up. Let me say also, if you have a woman who is truly right with God, her attitude while she leads from day one till the day a man finally shows up is to say, I'm willing at any moment to give this up. I'm willing at any moment, a man's willing to stand up here and take the lead. I'm willing to. That is the role of women in leadership. Next, women turn out every leader. You say, so women are, are just useless. No, what are you talking about? Do you realize that the hand that rocks the cradle really does rule the world? Ladies, you are responsible for every one of our young men that come out. The, 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 the ideas, the principles, the things that he likes, these things come from the mother. You are the one that from the very beginning has that great influence on him. We talked two years ago on Mother's Day about Moses' mother and the fact that dad was not involved. He couldn't be there. But God supernaturally made it so that there could be a mother involved in those early years of Moses' life. And as he got older and was under no other influence that was Hebrew, he still knew in his heart, I am a Hebrew. I do not belong to this Egyptian nation. I might look Egyptian. I might speak Egyptian. But I am a Hebrew. Who did that come from? From his mama. And that is incredible influence. Let me say that you mothers are going to decide what kind of a, of, of a mindset your children take into the world. If they see you as hardworking, as disciplined, as sweet, as kind, they're going to take those characteristics with them as well. That will have incredible influence on them. And on the, by the same token, if there is laziness, if there is anger, if there is impatience, they will pick those, those traits, more, more likely pick those traits as well. 
Mothers, you decide how long that influence goes. In the end, it's mom that says they're going to go to this school or that school. And then, and then it's the mother that says, I can't homeschool anymore. And then it's the mother who decides who's going to be the babysitter, who's going to be the daycare provider. In the end, mothers have incredible influence over, over their children directly and then indirectly by the influences they allow into their children's lives. I am so thankful that my mother decided I could go to Sunday school now. I'm so thankful that she allowed me to be under the men who taught me, and also first women who taught me, honestly. My first sinful teachers in my mind were women, 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 and then men, 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 men from that point on. But it was my mother that allowed that in my life. Let me say that to this day. I, I, I just, it's so odd to me. Um, I, I actually, in more of my personality, resembles my mom than my dad. I still do things that I realize, hey, that was my dad. But in, in the whole, on the whole, I am more like my mom than like my dad. My, as you, as many knows my mom, she's very politically like, just like, and, uh, and I can't help it. I kind of adopted that same thing, you know, and I just, that's why, you know, and uh, my team is better. Yours is just terrible, you know. Uh, uh, my, my, my personality comes more from my mom than my dad. Just it's how it is. I don't know why. Just God put it in me that way. My mother chose so much for me. But in our church, we need to have men who will stand up and lead. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, it says this, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, and in all the churches of the saints, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the church, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. I did not write that. It's in your Bible right now in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Timothy chapter number 2, it says, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, this does not mean that a woman never teaches. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, same book. It also says the older women are supposed to teach the younger women. That's how it's supposed to be. So we have, a, the Bible is very, very clear that the right order of things should be that men take the lead. Now, that doesn't mean that women are second-class citizens. By no means do you realize, ladies, that the whole reason that we are going to work every day is because we either hope to one day win a woman's heart and have her willingly let us live with this specimen of perfection for a whole life, or we already have chosen that one woman that we're going to live our entire lives with. I sure hope that 30 years from now, me and David Aguilar are still buddies and friends. Yes? Amen? But brother, I'll tell you what I really hope. I hope that I'm still living with my wife, that God has not taken her from me or me from her, that we are still, I can't, I, we were talking, uh, just messaging one of the guys, uh, one of my friends, and, 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 and I'm, I'll tell you something, uh, I, I'm, I'm dreading my kids leaving my home, but I'm also kind of looking forward to it. Woo! Amen, Brother Sondergaard. Yeah! And that day's coming when I'm going to say, goodbye, have a, have a good life. I'm going to close the door and be like, it's just us, baby! Woo! And you know what? I can't wait until it's just me and her. I'm a man. And let me say that I just want to spend my life with that woman. But I recognize that that woman is breakable. And as a man, I want to break before she does. I don't want the stresses and cares of life to pile up on her shoulders just because she's willing to because I can live a softer, easier life. No, I want those cares on my shoulders. Well, she can bear it. Probably better than me. But if anybody is going to get crushed by the cares and anxieties of life, it better be me. Because what God gifted me with 22 years ago was this amazing flower of incredible beauty and I want, don't want to cause that flower to wilt just because I am lazy. Amen? So in our church, this is how it is. Women are superior. Men, we open the doors for women. We carry the heavy burdens. Now, if some woman's swallow the pill and says, no, I want to carry it. I'm a real just like you. Don't be mean. Just say, yes, ma'am. But just, ladies, let me tell you why we're doing it. Not because we don't think you can't handle it, but because we don't want one 
bit more burden on you than it already is. Take it all off of you and let you live the easiest life that we could possibly give to you guys. Now let's talk about in the church and let's get out of here. Here's the reality. Next. Women are not men. There is a place in leadership, but it's not at the top. It's, a, it's, it's leading other women in the church. Women were important to Jesus. If you were to look at Jesus' ministry, sure enough, he called James, Peter, and Judith. Remember that? No, no. John, John. But he called these men, but that by no means means that Jesus had, had like this thing of, get away from me, you're a woman. By no means. Jesus had long conversations with women. Jesus had women come and touch the hem of his garment and be healed. Jesus was served by women. Jesus had women come and learn at his feet just like the men. Jesus was eventually helped by women as well as helping women. There were women all throughout his ministry. You can look at it and you can see Mary and Martha as they are one is there serving while Jesus teaches. The other is learning at his feet. You can see all through eventually where Jesus is then put on the cross. And as he's hanging there on the cross, you see him deserted by every one of his disciples. Only one of them, John, came to try to, to witness that moment when he was on that cross. And as he was there, guess who was also there? There was Mary, Martha, the other Mary, as well as the mother of Jesus there watching and witnessing of of all the men that followed him, only one showed up to witness that moment of his death. But there were four of the ladies that loved him who showed up. That is, the, is, is there. He did not say, go home. This is for men only. By no means. That's never been his thought process, ever. If you look at the tomb, Jesus was, was, was there laying there dead. And there were three women who decided, let's go and anoint his body. I know there's big, huge Roman guards there. I know that the other disciples are cowering up in the upper room. But somebody needs to go take care of, of our Savior's uh, uh, rotting body. Somebody needs to go and take care of that corpse. And so they went up to it, and they found it open. Glory to God. And went running back, telling the disciples. And then the disciples, these men, finally had the courage to go see what was going on. But it was women that did that. Turn with me to one more verse to this morning. Turn to Romans chapter number 16. Women in the church are essential. They are so essential. Now, we will not have a woman in our church become pastor. Let me say that the day when it has to happen that way, when there is, let me, let me just give you a scenario. Imagine a day when every woman in this room uh, that has left at our church is 60 years plus, and there's uh, your pastor, um, and he's 85 years old, and uh, there's been no soul winning and nobody gotten saved. And uh, there's, recently there was a guy got saved. And he's, you know, he's 23 years old and just got saved. And, and then the pastor kicks the bucket. I'm sorry, we're going to have to have a woman run the Bible study. No men to do it. That's the reality. This church right now has men. Men need to stand up and lead. Men one of the hardest things for us to do is to overcome our own lethargy and lead. If there is no man in your home who's going to stand up and lead, ladies, if he abdicates that and says, I'm not leading, thank you for leading. Thank you for saying, well, I'm going to make sure me and the kids get to church. And he says, okay. Now, would it be better for your husband? Yes, yes. But if he advocates that role, fill it. Become the Deborah in your own home. We can do this. We're going to serve Jesus. Sweetheart, I'd love to have you, you lead. I'm not doing that. Okay. Lead. But men, your wife wants When I was a I'll give you the illustration in a moment. Verse chapter 16, verse number 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. Now, if you know what's going to happen here, he's about to go through a long list of names. He's finished the book of Romans in chapter 15, verse 33. Now he's going to sign off. And here's how he signs off, by greeting people. And the very first person he met, Phoebe, our sister, which was a servant of the church, the church which is at Sincrea, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. Now look at the next one. Look at this one. 
Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. You have this couple named Priscilla and Aquila. Now, now which one is the husband? Who can tell me? Aquila. You know that? You know that very, right? You knew it was Aquila, right? Ladies first, is that what it is? You look at the rest of your Bible, you know what you always see? The man and the woman. But for these two, there was something about Priscilla that got her name first. Usually it's the man and his wife. Brother and Mrs. Miracle, Brother and Mrs. Andrieri. That's how it works. This is Brother and Mrs. Frank. Amen? But in this case, it's Mrs. and Brother Scott. I'm just, Priscilla gets mentioned first. You know why? Because she was such a blessing. Amen? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. If you keep going, he'll, he'll mention other names here. Look at verse number six. Greet Mary, which bestowed much labor on us. Now he begins to mention other people. Um, and Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners. Then you look at verse number eight, uh, Am, uh, Amplius. Uh, then you look at Urbain. Uh, you look at all these others. But if you skip down to verse number 13, you will see a couple of the ladies mentioned here. It says, salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labored in the Lord. That is, those are two ladies. Look at verse number 13, the end. It says, uh, verse number 13, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Look at verse number 15. It says this, salute uh, uh, Philologus and Julia, and Nurses, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Julia is a girl's name. Then you have Narcissus' sister, you have another young lady there. You have this long list of men and women there. It's by no means the idea that the church is just all men and women just sit there and they do nothing. By no means. They are suckering. They are serving. They are being a blessing on every level. But let me just say that we must have men who will stand up. Now, when I was in high school, I've told you the story. I'll tell you again. Every time we'd come back from PE, we would have run in formation. Us boys. The girls had their own PE. I don't know what they did. They probably did volleyball or something girly. I love volleyball. Not girly. But uh, the men, we would, they would, we would have a Marine, a couple of Marines, they would run us. And we would run in cadence. In fact, the man who's coming tonight, uh, you can ask him about it. He was there. And we would get to the, to the park, and we would do push-ups, and we'd do jumping jacks and whatever else they make us do. And then we would get down. We would play actual tackle football without any pads. We would just knock each other around. And, and, uh, and we'd play basketball. And the man who's here coming tonight, he blew out his knee. And uh, you can ask him about that too as well. And uh, with us playing basketball. Um, and so we would have a great time. And then we'd all finish, and we would get our water bottles, and then we'd start running back. And here was the goal. The goal was to walk into our classroom for dismissal. Now, I, I, we never discussed this. I can tell you it was true for me, and I can tell you it was to be as sweaty as possible. Now, ladies, this might disgust you, but we thought that impressed you. Then it began to rain. E day. It was soccer time. Dark. Then we had some of the best soccer I've ever played. We were rolling in the Our desks dirty, covered in this dirty slime. You know what we wanted to show you? We can do it. We're tough. There's something in us that thinks that what a woman wants is someone who is strong, who can take care of her, who will do what it takes to protect her, who will be the man. In our day, that position has been usurped by the state. Instead of you calling your daddy to protect you, you call the police to protect you. When you need grocery money, you don't expect your man to go out and work for it. You expect this, 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 the county to give you a check. Let me say... In that case, you don't want a real strong man, do you? You want a friend who will listen to you. But as our system eventually comes to its culmination, 
where it implodes in on itself. Then, manly men will suddenly be a premium. Anthony, I respect you, brother. I know a little bit about your background. Someday I'll have you tell the story of what happened in your family. That is amazing. That's so cool. I hope I could have done what you did. That's amazing. Manliness is all around us right now. I'm looking at real men right now who I respect. Let me say that our church is very, very blessed. But men, it's important that we choose every single day to be the ones who get out of bed, get our Bibles read, get on our knees before God, and get to work and put in a full day's labor. Church, we need men to run right up here. Ladies, you know what we're doing it for? For the Lord, but also because we want you to think, wow. Now, in our church, I want to have the most beautiful, godly, sober, wonderful ladies anywhere in this county, in this church right now. I think we're already there. Let's not lose it. Let's pray. Father.